Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD bodybuilder, back with another episode on Swole Radio. Today, I have the honor of being joined by Joe Bennett or the Hypertrophy Coach, who is a very well known bodybuilding coach, having coached Terrence Ruffin, who is the Mr. O runner up and Arnold Classic Physique Champion. I really respect you, Joe, for your knowledge of biomechanics and especially what I gather from your content and tips I picked up along the way. So thanks for being on the show. Yeah, man. Happy to be here. Yeah. So today we're going to have a really fun episode that I think a lot of people are going to enjoy. We're going to talk about Joe's favorite underrated exercises or exercise modifications, as well as Mm -hmm. training cues that he likes to use for advanced athletes. And as you know, on my YouTube channel, we talk more about more beginner intermediate stuff, but on the podcast, we get to really delve into the nitty gritty of advanced training techniques. So I think this is something that everyone's going to be able to pick up something new and exercise selection is one of those things that's very subjective. Mm -hmm. There's really no right or wrong answer, but it's something that you need to test yourself and it never hurts to have new ideas. So Mm -hmm. I think this will be enjoyable. Sure. Yeah. So to jump right into it, I figure we can just try and cover all the main muscle groups and just get a few ideas and bounce around some thoughts. So Mm -hmm. starting off with legs, starting off with the big muscle groups. So the quads, Joe, what are your, some of your favorites? Um, I mean, you know, so I, I try and uh, just to kind of get some context for some of this as well too, is, um, you know, I I like to try and have some principles that are just kind of like umbrella that I think basically with, with any body part. Um, And, and, you know, and and a good thing for that is like where I think that helps people instead of just basically going with the dogma of like people will list, like these are the exercises you have to do for legs, for quads, for biceps, for whatever. And uh, the same as anything, when something's been around for a little bit and, you know, you look at, it's like I, I, the joke is even like looking at, um, if I've done this exact analogy before, but you're like looking at the shoes Michael Jordan's wearing or whatever, you know, you're looking at what the elites are doing or what they're using and making the assumption that, okay, well, what they're doing and what they're using is what works best because they're elite. But the same thing with Michael Jordan, the same thing with Ronnie Coleman, is there's things that predetermine who can be the absolute best in the world. And then, of course, accompanied with, you know, we, we know things about Ronnie Coleman and Michael Jordan that their work ethic is still unparalleled. So those things coming together. So mm-hmm. um, a lot of stuff, I think, just gets perpetuated by dogma. So having some principles that you just kind of umbrella over everything, you can kind of run things through a filter. So it's like if someone says, hey, this is a great exercise, you can think, OK, well, here's kind of things I think related to exercise. And that way, when you're going body part by body part or working through, it's not really as much of a emotional thing then where it's like, oh, I'm just doing this because this guy did this or this guy did that. Yeah. I'm doing it because it kind of meets these principles that I look at. Um, so some of the big principles that I use um, really are uh, two of the biggest really are alignment and profiles. Um, you know, and so alignment is a whole bunch of stuff. You know, it's this notion of, you know, alignment. Am I actually targeting the right muscle? You know, so if it's between something where, okay, I could, for this exercise, I could use my front delts a lot where I could use my chest a lot. Do I have an alignment that's going to bias the muscle I'm trying to train? Mm-hmm. And then there's this notion of alignment for, Um, perceived orthopedic health, you know, what's going to be the most joint friendly as well, too. Um, And then the other ones that I look at, you know, when we're talking about profiles, that one's really, you know, you can kind of go down the rabbit hole for that one. The big thing with that one is this notion of efficiency, you know, so if we're going to talk about, you know, I do work with, you know, more, I've worked with everywhere from, you know, grandmas and great grandmas up to the elite bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you're working with the elite, I think the notion of efficiency becomes much more important. Um, And so those are the two kind of biggest pillars. So you know, alignment will make sure one, we're actually doing what we want to do with the exercise, but we're targeting what we want to target. And then also working with elite longevity is huge. So people, you know, I'll get people that right when they start, they'll be like, oh, why would I care about that? I'm just going to do this exercise. And then I get those same people 10 years down the road. They're like, oh, my elbows hurt. My knees hurt. Everything's broken. I'm like, okay, well, this is where this kind of comes in a little bit more. Sometimes people actually need to feel the adverse effects themselves yeah. before it really kind of hits home of like, oh, maybe this kind of stuff is important. And then a couple other ones I go with uh, bracing is a big thing, bracing and complexity. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you had something one, too complex, a good example, that would be like Olympic lifting. You know, it's like, why wouldn't you have Olympic lifting and bodybuilding? Well, the complexity of it, I mean, it's literally a sport in and of itself, or at least was a sport in and of itself. And so there's such a complexity, skill component, um, coordination component. And then from there, just the amount of muscles involved as well, too. Because of that stuff, I would say, well, this isn't going to be the most efficient thing we could do for bodybuilding. It's not to say that someone that's done Olympic lifting hasn't put on muscle from doing it. But arguably, again, because of all those limiting factors, it might not be the most efficient thing for bodybuilding. Mm. And then bracing, again, is I always use the simple example of like um, bracing is like a, uh, the back pad on a leg press. 
you know, so if I took there, and you can do this example with every exercise, every body part, but if I took the back pad off of a leg press, how efficient of an exercise would it be? It would no longer be, you can just get in there and wail away on it and have everything in your lower body being taken to full failure. It would be, okay, how much can I actually hold with my abs and hip flexion? And that would be the limiting factor instead of your legs. Um, so those are some of the big principles I try and use when picking exercises and make sure they kind of fit those categories as well as possible. Mm. Um, so when I'm looking at things like back to quads, the long answer to get back to something like quads, um, I mean, this is where you, you can put things through filter and we know, you know, anecdotal evidence is still important evidence. So we do know things that seem to work across all populations. Mm -hmm. um, so starting with like the most common thing is like, I think some sort of squat pattern is a great thing. I um, mean, if we're looking at this profile thing, so tying into profile is like, what muscle length specifically are we really taxing? And again, if we're getting into the, the nerdy, the science side of it, mm -hmm. there seems to be a lot of evidence that the lengthened specifically through the mid range of most exercises might be the best opportunity to overload that position if we want to have the most growth out of it. Yeah. Um, and it really comes back to, you know, intramuscular force is probably the most important thing where we can have peak intramuscular force is probably the key driver for hypertrophy. There's other stuff and other evidence for things like obviously metabolic stimulus and pathways and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it's nice that it seems like most everyone agrees, all right, things that have peak intramuscular force are a good thing to focus on. So we look at squat patterns, a typical squat pattern done properly. If we're looking at quads, um, you know, getting to full knee flexion, you know, so hamstring smushing into your calf, that's going to be a fully lengthened quad, maybe minus the rec fem. And um, so that's why I think traditionally squat patterns do work so well. So we can look at everybody says, oh, you have to squat, you have to squat. The only little asterisk I'd add to that is say, okay, well, looking at bodybuilding, like, do I have to do a barbell back squat? Mm -hmm. You know, does it have to be with my feet flat on the floor? Could I do it with a heel elevation? Um, what about a squat pattern in a machine? Um, and so when I get into what works best, I think this is where there's an individualization component. Um, so from a pure nerd standpoint, I could make an argument, something like a hack squat is going to be one of the absolute best exercises because one, it overloads that position that we're trying to get to full knee flexion and length and quad mid range of quad. It's also very braced and stable. So compared to a free weight squat, because you have the back pad, because you have this fixed path, there's less, less complexity to deal with. So on paper, I can make the argument, oh, our hack squats are better than free weight squats. But when you get with an individual involved, you know, what they like, how they perform and other limitations they might have, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be something where I would definitively say, oh, this is better. I would consider what they like to do, how they perform it and things like that. Um, so, you know, if, if for quad type stuff, um, squat patterns are great. Hacks are one of my favorites. So anyone's seen um, when we're talking profiles, that's a place for uh, properly used accommodating resistance, properly used bands, in my opinion. You set mm -hmm. them up properly on a hack squat and people say, excuse me, well, what's the difference between doing a hack squat with bands or without bands? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, if we're looking at a typical squat pattern, it is absolutely the most challenging in the bottom. And that's just basically how, you know, we express force at our joints or how that bar on our back expresses force on our joints. There's going to be peak torque in that bottom position. And as you come up, it basically gets easier and easier, less torque on the trained joints. And everybody kind of knows that, right? So if I said, could you you know, quarter squat, the top quarter or the bottom quarter of a squat, which one could you do more reps? And you don't have to know anything about profiles to know you could do a lot more at the top. So I say, just walk around gyms everywhere and you can see that there's a lot of people quarter squat in four plates. There's not a, a lot of people <laughs> burying four plates, um, you know, doing it just at the bottom. So the notion is that because you are so much stronger at the top, if I properly set up bands on something like a hack, I'm basically making it heavier, progressively heavier as I get to the top. And that really just comes to the argument of, is that more efficient? Um, and I would say, if you're going to go into the gym and you're going to travel through this range of motion, you might as well make that whole range of motion as challenging as possible. And so that's where we get kind of, of some things that we'll talk that I think are more important for advanced athletes might be considering properly set up accommodating resistance as well too. So where like alignment's important in my opinion for everybody, whether you know it or not, you want things that are joint friendly, hit the muscle. Um, I, you could make the argument that's like, well, does someone that's a beginner or an intermediate need to do bands, chains, accommodating resistance? And um, I, I wouldn't say it's bad for them, but I would also say that it is a pretty fair argument. They might not need to, but because everything training is progressive and adaptive, you might have to have at some point with a more advanced athlete. It's like, okay, well, we need to maybe be as efficient as possible with every exercise you're doing and all the range of motion that you're going through. Um, so some of my go-tos for quads, hack squats, banded hack squats. Um, with free weight stuff, I tend to do a lot of heel elevation stuff. So whether it's heel elevated front squats, heel elevated back squats, safety squat, like the safety squat bar is probably the best free weight squat variation in my opinion. Um, and again, the, the heel elevation is an example of 
kind of in that alignment thing. You can change the mechanics of how you do the exercise um, and kind of changes, again, where that load on your back expresses uh, as torque at joints. So it can make it all other things being the same, more torque at the knee, more demands from the quads, and at the same time, less from the hips and less from the back. Um, so I would say those, those are probably some of my top however many exercises that is three, four variations for quads. Mm -hmm. Um, but hopefully that gives a little context too, for some of the, you know, if we go down for a few different body parts, why I like the exercises that I like. Um, Mm -hmm. and that whole thing too, is a tricky, I always put a little asterisk for everybody. There's, you know, in the Instagram world, the TikTok world, you know, it's very catchy to say, here's the best exercise. And I've, I've literally done covers of videos for that too, because I joke, it's like, here's my clickbait, come find the best exercise. Yeah. Um, and I, and I understand the notion of people, you know, cause I'm, I'm the same as, you know, you learn something new, you want to go and say, okay, this person's an expert. Just tell me what to do. I just want to know the right thing to do. And so I always tell people now there's, I don't think there technically is a best of almost any body part or any exercise, but there is a good place to start. Right. So the same thing that you know, you're asking me, I, I don't want to go too saying, okay, well, there is no best exercise. And then someone's like, well, that doesn't help me at all. I just want to go to the gym. Just tell me what to do. And that way I'll, with a lot of things go, here's a, here's a great place to start. And again, any of those squat patterns, I would say to people figure out which one you like the best, you perform the best at, um, and then you, you can stick with that. It's not like you have to do hacks or have to do squat variation, whatever it is. I think that is where there's an individual component that kind of comes into it as well, too. Yeah, no, those are great points. I really like how you have a sort of principled approach to exercise selection. And this is something, yeah, it's definitely worth mentioning and reemphasizing that uh, a lot of the stuff we'll talk about today may not necessarily apply to beginners. And I just want to specifically couch that, that we're talking about advanced athletes. And when you start talking about people who are advanced, you start running into these more nuanced issues, like, as you mentioned, specifically thinking about uh, longevity. And the other thing that kind of ties in is sort of uh, fatigue. So like, I like to think about things in terms of your uh, stimulus to fatigue ratio, where you, as you become more advanced, it's, it's more of a, more and more of an issue of how much fatigue you're generating. And especially with big, heavy, like classic compound movements, like a free weight squat or deadlift, as you become advanced, you start running into, into a lot of issues. If you, if you try to continue to use those really basic exercises as your staples, even though they are often useful and can bring great results for beginners so yeah, yeah. this is something that I, i'm kind of assuming we're assuming that uh beginners have tried out all the the major compounds and mastered those movement patterns first which i think is mm-hmm. a value in itself and just uh mm-hmm. progressing in those movement patterns yeah yeah so moving on uh, how about hamstrings um so hamstrings going go into some, some of the same things this is the ones where i'll get you know people will the first thing I'll say, I'll just throw this out there and then kind of walk down the path of those, why I like this again. But if I had to pick one single place to start for, for hamstrings, I always say the seated um, hamstring curl machine. Nice. And so I get, you know, the, the traditionalist will be like, oh no, it's gotta be barbell RDLs. Barbell RDLs are king. The machine can't be, you know, the king. And this is one of those things again, where if the, the, in my opinion, the idea of having some of these concepts, and even like you said, if they don't always apply to beginners, I always tell people the most important thing you can do is, is think when you're training. I mean, it sounds <laughs> silly, but if you're really like, I'm doing this because this person did this, that's not really thinking that's copying. Right. And if it's, yeah. and it's perceivably like a lot of people, it's like, well, why I met, and I remember being, when I've done a lot of good continuing education coming, cause I grew up uh, just being a bodybuilder meathead. Like I, I got into it because of Arnold, Arnold's encyclopedia of modern oh, bodybuilding, yeah. <laughs> just consuming as much bodybuilding, everything as possible. I mean, I had like a decade's worth of like every single bodybuilding magazine ever until after a decade, I realized, Hey, they're just printing the same stuff over and over. (laughs) over. And, um, but I, I mean, I love that stuff. And there's obviously a lot of value to take from the bodybuilding world. But when I was challenged from some actual structured education and some good educators saying like, really asking me like, well, what is the, what is that belief built upon? If I'd say that, you know, the bench press is the king of all chest exercises, they'd be like, what is that built on? And I remember getting emotional and angry being challenged at first. That's a big thing. If you know, you get emotional and angry, when someone asks you why you do something, it might be a good indicator that you don't actually have good principles it's built on because, and I'm saying that from having experienced that myself, and I'll still probably continue to experience that to some degree. Um, but someone asked me that, and basically my answer was, well, because Arnold said so. And it's like, okay, well, that is evidence. And that's, what's this credentials? Who is this person? Why are they saying that? And again, it's, I don't think any evidence is bad. You just really need to say, okay, well, any evidence that just comes from one person might not be the strongest foundation that's one little drop of you know wherever it's all coming from Mm -hmm. um 
so anyway, for all this kind of stuff, even if you're, you know, kind of beginner intermediate and some of this stuff is like, oh, do I really need to care about it? I think it's nice for people just to start thinking, right? So it's actually like, if I'm going to start this habit, at least have some sort of idea why I'm doing it, you know, what the reasons are I'm doing it. And that way, as you're going from the beginner to advanced, like that's things you kind of would figure out on their own as you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And you go from beginner, you know, you've been back squatting for three, four, five years. And then all of a sudden, like now back squats, it's like, you know, they're basically, you feel like you have to take eight days to recover from them. Maybe mm-hmm. you feel like other stuff is starting to be limited before your quads are. It's good to be able to like, okay, well, I've got these things that here's maybe why I feel this or this and that, and actually have a decent thought process. Um, mm-hmm. So back to the, the leg curls is that looking at the principles, the, the seated leg curl, in my opinion, is great because it really overloads the length and position again. So it's going to train the hamstrings uh, really primarily through their length and position and their mid range. It won't get them fully shortened or fully contracted. Um, And then for looking at the other things, I mean, regardless of if the machine itself has a decent profile, even if it's not great, it's going to overload that range of motion. And then from a complexity and bracing standpoint, if you have a good one with a good thigh pad, you know, even ideally, if you had something with a seatbelt, you could create the only limiting factor would be hamstrings. Um, So you don't have to really have to worry about stabilizing your pelvis, your back and all that. And those things could potentially be limiting factors, whereas we go to an RDL, RDLs are a great exercise. They do overload the hamstrings, their length and range but you have a whole lot of other stuff going on there. You've got all your other hip extensors could work. So a lot of people, like, and again, when I work with elite, if you get ridiculously strong in RDLs, something on the back of your body is going to get huge. But a lot of people, and in my world, a lot of bodybuilders that can tend to be glutes. I've seen people where they do RDLs, 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 and their hamstrings are wildly mediocre and their glutes are giant. And it's like, well, Mm -hmm. depending on your structure, depending on how you're set up, even though the hamstrings are going to fully lengthen in an RDL and the glutes don't, it's still, you can potentially just the mechanics of how the glutes work and cross over the joint, they can always be biased to just do more work. So one, you could just have another muscle doing more work. Adductors can contribute to that motion as well too. But then also you have everything basically between the bar, which is in your hands and your hamstrings, that's everything in between can legitimately be a limiting factor. So whether that's grip, upper body stability, your entire spine, the whole way along, you know, your erectors, if any of that stuff starts to go, Again, that could be the limiting factor and your hamstrings might not even get added with stimulus to keep growing. Um, so hmm. that's some things why I would say, okay, for, especially for advanced people, ironically enough, is that's why I tend to go more prioritizing things like seated leg curls. Um, so I would say my top three for hamstrings just would be seated leg curls, um, you know, RDL lying leg curls. And, and the reality, when I say with this kind of stuff, I generally, I program all of them, you know, so even when I have that awareness, yeah. like I have a couple of pros legitimately right now that do both. And when I say, for them, if I'm going to have an RDL in their program, lots of times I will just, and if hamstrings are the goal, I will just prioritize the leg curl in the programming and then have RDL somewhere later on. Um, and again, that kind of gets in this notion of a pre-exhaust type thing as well too, where again, maybe now if you've actually you know trained your hamstrings prior in isolation to doing an RDL, maybe they're going to be the limiting factor, more likely to be the limiting factor of the RDL, as opposed to if you started earlier on, yeah, you might be able to use more load, but you might be recruiting more glutes, more rectors, and more whatever. So hmm Yeah, no, great thoughts. And yeah, I, I like how you mentioned that we're looking for the stretch. And I think that the, I'm a big fan of including stretch uh, type movements mm-hmm. where we have some early evidence now that you might get a benefit from the stretch mediated sort of pathway. And mm-hmm. the C curls, seated leg curls, a great example of that. Mm-hmm. How about for glutes then? Um, glutes, so I, I mean, I think when you're basically you know, doing where the the main function is, you know, hip extension. And so there's a lot of options with glutes and you have a lot of people talking about the glutes too. It's kind of an interesting conversation, but their ability to produce some external rotation, produce, Mm -hmm. um, you know, some abduction as well too. Um, And I think those can be fine to work on, but if you look at the people that produce the best results training glutes from an individual standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, obviously I look at people like Brett Contreras. If you actually dig into like the where the prime, where his primary programming it is, and what I've seen for the most benefit as well too, is going to be prioritizing hip extension. Um, so again, the, I would probably say my top ones on that, and this is very individual as well too, because especially because again, what I said with glutes too is, you know, what can else can extend your hips, your hamstrings, can your adductors, mm-hmm. can those are some of the big ones. Um, and so there's a little bit of an individualization component here as well too. So the best exercises are going to be probably able to work for most people. But I do where some people just connect better with, you know, some people because of, let's say, out of the, a squat pattern, they even if they feel their glutes or they're able to use and grow their glutes, they might have a lot of quad involvement. They might have mm-hmm. a lot of adductor involvement as well, too. Um, so this is where I might buy something, maybe like a glute bridge or something like that as well, too. So I would say my top ones would be 
Um, you know, I honestly, I love leg press is one of the best, most underrated glute ones. I love thrust variations, to be honest. And if you look through the principle, someone will say, well, if you think about what I'm saying, like well, with a thrust, the only issue with the thrust is it overloads the shortened position for the glutes and, you know, gets the mid range a little bit as well there too. And mm -hmm. someone say, well, wouldn't you want to bias, um, you know, the length and position. And, and I think you absolutely should, and you should have the length and position still prioritized with exercise selection. Mm -hmm. But again, because of the nature of glutes and because of how many other muscles can do the same type of motion, that's why a thrust so this is where some of those principles, you still have to look at the individual. So if someone particularly has a hard time actually connecting and using their glutes, maybe historically, they've just got big hamstrings, big adductors, something like a thrust could be a great thing to prioritize for them because it's going to take those other muscles out of it a lot. You know, when you shorten that hamstring, you know, with that knee flex doing a thrust and again, just overloading a position where the hamstrings can do basically nothing. That's a great way to bias the glutes. So thrust variations are great. Leg press squat patterns can be great. Deadlift variations can be great. Um, you know, split squat variations, step ups mm. are amazing. Um, <clears throat> so again, there's really a whole lot of, I think the, the kind of traditional, hip extension type movements are really, really good. Uh, and then honestly, whenever I program with stuff with people, like, so if I had a brand new client or something that I'm working with yeah. and glutes were a priority, I'm going to kind of go through all those at some point in time, you know, maybe over the course of two or three sessions, I might focus on maybe two of those at a time each session, maybe three of those each session. And then kind of based on how they perform them, their feedback and all that kind of stuff, then I might start to kind of figure out which ones I'm going to spend more time programming. Because while there's unique things, of course, to doing something single leg, so there's obviously something different between a leg press and a split squat variation or something. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> excuse me. They both have a similar function where set up, they can both overload the glutes in the length and position. Um, so again, really when it comes down to how the person performs them um, and how they connect with them, you know, that's where I would really select, well, when would you, you know, choose a leg press over a split squat, you know, aside from the stability component, limiting factor component, not as much coordination, I really go with what the individual, you know, works with well, because I'll have some people, even if I said the leg press is great, you know, the leg press is one of those exercises that's a true closed chained exercise. So if you're really just not great at using your glutes, your bodies can easily find another solution there, meaning can quads, adductors, um, you know, even stuff like calves can recruit on that as well, too. So um, those are probably some of my top ones. There's a lot of really good options there. And I don't, I don't think as much as right now, I think it's kind of popular to really, I don't want to say bash, but a lot of people put a lot of content saying like how bad bands are and how bad training isolated um, abduction is and external rotation. And I don't, I don't always think that's the case. You know, that's one of those things we look at, we look at literature and we look at things that are very important. Like people look at moment arms and stuff like mm. that. Um, you know, the two things that are, I don't think a lot of people consider with that research, which is good is um, how different hip structure can be. I mean, I've seen different pictures of pelvis where, you know, the, the acetabulum mm. basically will face forward almost mm. and somewhere it faces almost to the side. And, you know, you can't tell me if you got an acetabulum that faces almost 90 degrees difference on someone. And obviously you got to imagine these are some extremes. So I'm sure these examples I'm seeing them evoke because that's most people aren't on those extremes. Mm -hmm. They're going to be somewhere in the middle. You know, how someone's stance is set up could be very different um, for someone else. So if we say, oh, if we go too wide, it's more adductors. It's like, well, I don't technically, I didn't bring my x-ray. I don't really know how this person's femur is sitting in the side of their pelvis. So that I think there's a reason sometimes people might actually feel their glutes more on sumo stuff and might actually have some benefit for some people. Um, and then the same too is it's ironically, the bigger your glutes get, the more those moment arm things actually change. You know, So internal moment arms, mm -hmm. people don't talk about that a whole lot. They say, hey, here's what we see on these internal moment arms. And again, I, I honestly, I'm gonna be the first person that's I don't always get into the weeds as far as what's the population when we're looking at these. Um, but I guarantee it's not people with massive glutes, right? You know, So a lot of times when we're looking at moment arms, especially if we're ever doing things a lot with anatomy, we're looking at cadavers and stuff as well too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's on relatively normal, sometimes small human beings. Whereas if we're looking at someone that trains and their whole focus is these massive glutes, and ironically enough, someone that already has big glutes, they might say, well, I feel this abduction type stuff great, or I feel this external rotation, or I feel this wider stance great. And their feel is actually a good feel because they've produced results and they know what it actually means to have a feeling translate to muscles growing. It's because their moment arms might be different because of the size of their glutes compared to, you know, what some of these studies are done on. So I always add that in there as well, too, because I get a lot of questions about bands and people doing the abduction machine and this and that. And, um, and again, I think that the thing where it gets lost is, and again, if you look at Brett's like the perfect example, if you actually know Brett, know his programming, mm -hmm. you know, 80 or 90% of his programming is around big hip extension movements, you know, squat patterns, deadlift patterns, all the things that I mentioned, but he finds merit in actually doing some banded work, abduction work, external rotation work, 
And I think, again, if someone's primary goal is glutes, where it's like not like they have to allocate, you know, every single body part, the priority is the same. I think there can be merit for actually incorporating some of that stuff in programming as well, too. And that's when the, you know, the individual becomes important as well, too. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, no, great thoughts. And I like how you also mentioned the fact that, you know, you will try out all these movements with people and exercise selection is one of those things where you really have to try it yourself. And Mm -hmm. often, yeah, it's, it's not like we, everyone has just the one exercise they do and often it's it's best to have a few in your tank or in your arsenal that you kind of yeah. rotate in and out depending on mm-hmm. what you need or having specific applications that you yeah. want to apply so yeah moving on to the upper body then if mm-hmm. we could talk about chest for sure yeah i think honestly chest is one of those and again some of it's kind of for just the semantic reasons of how you know when you're doing pressing movements particularly uh, the force expresses again at the shoulder joint and then hopefully in turn of the pec you've you've got a ton of good options i mean i can honestly say almost any pressing movement can be a great option and and can be one of the things that should be done for chest so again if we look at again traditionally what's what's worked you know it's not bad to say people say oh bench press is the king this and that it's like well pressing movements do seem to be the thing that's probably should be prioritized in your programming and why depending on the pressing movement and how you uh, choose to do it they tend to overload the mid and the length and range again Um, flies obviously can overload the length and range as well too um, but pressings tend to be uh, very, very efficient again and overloading those ranges motion that we know we want to prioritize. Mm-hmm. And then the thing where people miss it is I think you just really need to have that alignment thing, you know, so find out what works best with you, what feels best for you as well, too. Um, and again, from an orthopedic standpoint, like there are some things, of course, you might not feel initially, it might catch up with you 10 years down the road. But there's a lot of people, especially when pressing, they'll do stuff and the immediate feedback is all I feel is delts or all I feel is shoulder joint stuff. And it's like if you feel that at all, abandon ship you know that does not need to be your pressing movement and i'll use the example of myself i mean i did flat barbell bench press for like a decade because you're basically required to if you're a male <laughs> and um and i honestly I, there were times even when i started to like educate myself a little bit anecdotally right away there were times when it really just felt like complete garbage and then when i kind of got this idea of form and changing the way that i could do it i could kind of make it work or i could make it feel better but even when i kind of figured out i knew like you know, logically, not unemotionally, I probably shouldn't do this exercise. I still stuck with it <laughs> yeah. for a few more years. And I, I injured my shoulder several times repeatedly doing the same thing until I was like, man, like I don't actually, I don't compete at bench pressing. Why do I need to do bench pressing? And um, so again, I think it's, uh, it's not wrong to say, okay, well, here's some of the big stuff that works, but especially in the muscle building world, especially in the bodybuilding world is don't be afraid for just subtle modifications. I mean, can someone honestly tell me that a barbell is superior to a dumbbell a flat dumbbell press. I mean, I could argue, I can make the argument the other way easily that the dumbbell might be superior. Yeah. And then, and then even aside from all the subtle things of alignment and arm path freedom and range of motion and stuff where I could say, here's the reasons why a dumbbell might be superior. Just the obvious thing should be as well too is okay. If you're a newbie and you can press 40 pound dumbbells for 10 and it feels good, you feel it in your chest, you know, you're actually seeing some results or whatever. You're getting this good feedback, not just from when you're doing it, but you know, long-term, if you go from pressing forties for 10 to pressing 140s for 10, you know, form stays the same, we don't deviate, your chest is going to get bigger, right? Mm -hmm. So again, just with that very simple logic, why the hell would I have to do a bench press? Like you don't, you don't have to do any exercise. Um, So Mm -hmm. honestly, that's the chest is probably one of the most individualized, um, Mm -hmm. you know, body parts as far as exercise selection. I've used it all over and even with myself and when I'm training Terrence, we'll rotate those constantly and just kind of go with what feels good. We do a lot of just like, um, you know, most pressing, we do low incline stuff. We've done low incline barbell, low incline dumbbell, low incline Smith, low incline machines. Um, again, most machines are honestly pretty great as well too. So even stuff that doesn't maybe have the best profile still has a lot of merit. So most pressing machines, um, I honestly love prime stuff. Obviously prime has got some pretty darn good profiles, but even most hammer strength stuff is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for typically for a chest workout, if I'm working with an individual, I will generally do, you know, one flat ish to low incline press i'll generally do one kind of high incline press Mm. and on those i'll generally go from you know a slightly tucked elbow to maybe a little bit more tucked elbow if i'm going for more just kind of overall development to maybe trying to bias to some of those fibers that attach to your clavicle Mm. and then i always generally have at least one fly variation and normally i do like to have something where that upper arm path is at a little bit more of a decline Um, and normally just for shoulder joint structure things i tend to program that as flies generally. I mean, I don't think all decline pressing is bad, but you will have, I think, a larger population that's not as comfortable for the shoulder joint. Um, so for that reason, if I'm going to do kind of a decline arm path or an arm path that just kind of lines up with these fibers that attach more to the base of your sternum or tertiary ribs, 
I think flies work very, very well for that. Um, so that's a typical chest for most people who want a complete chest workout. That's my, my three movement structure right there. And literally it's all across the board. I mean, for the only thing I'll say I generally do for the fly variation is almost always going to either be cables if the, if the person has it available or something like a pec deck uh, just for the loading pattern. It's a, a benefit of flies as well too is one, it can fully train the lengthened position, but it also can train the fully short and fully contracted position as well too, but it has to be loaded there, which you can't do with a dumbbell. Uh, so that's the reason why I generally we have a cable um, or a, a, maybe a pec deck in there as well too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, great thoughts. And I like how you, um, you know, emphasize that there's really no like need to do a bench press or any specific, mm-hmm. any specific movement for that, for that matter. And a lot of people really get into the rut of, you know, the big three and they, yeah. I think one of the massive luxuries that we have as bodybuilders is the variation that we have access to. Like there are so yeah. many different pathways to hypertrophy and that's mm-hmm. like something really special about this sport, I think, where in most sure. places, like, I mean, I used to run track and right, like you, you do one event like say you're yeah. pro javelin right like yeah. if you if you hurt your shoulder doing javelin like from from overuse it's it's really hard to work around it because ultimately that's what you got to do yeah whereas for us we can really just swap things out and find what works yeah yeah, yeah how yeah, about absolutely. the back this is gonna be a cool one yeah backs uh yeah backs one of the more challenging ones especially yeah. if we look at all the all the muscle groups involved because obviously that's the tricky part with backs people say oh it's back day and it's like well it's how many body, how many, uh, how many uh, body parts or muscle groups are we actually talking about yeah. between what we can see just, you know, erectors, lats, traps, you know, some of the rotator cuff stuff up there as well, too. Um, that's, I think that's, people have observed this obviously for a long period of time. Back development can be tricky uh, because again, it's, it's complex. So there's a lot of muscle groups involved. Uh, it can be tricky because you can't see it. Um, and so again, there's, you know, this whole mind muscle connection thing. There's a, there's a happy balance that needs to occur there where some people get a little too caught up on it. But at the same time, if you can't feel the trained muscle at all, or you feel another muscle when you're trying to train a specific muscle, obviously that's not good as well either. And so visually being able to see things I do think is a beneficial thing. And so that's obviously why back training can be tricky. Um, So, I mean, if I'm looking just on paper, we'll start with what I would consider like a complete back workout. And I'll use some of the exercises that are kind of my, my favorite core ones. And then just kind of just explain that just a little bit. Um, so as far as like upper back development goes, and when I say upper back, I'm just basically talking like shoulder to shoulder, you know, so if everything that's in between there, so we're talking traps, you know, obviously you can't see them, but obviously we're talking rhomboids, you know, we have some of your, uh, rotator cuff stuff that's more superficial, Terry mm-hmm. stuff that you can see. Um, and even rear delt tossing it in there as well too. Mm-hmm. I just love chest supported rowing variations yes. and that could be a lot of stuff. So chest supported T-bar rows, if your gym has it, one of my absolute favorite. Um, and that's an example of something that's again, anecdotally, like that's a, Luckily, that's a meathead thing. That's meatheads like, yeah, T-bar row is great. Um, I do put the asterisks of chest supported because people are like, oh, well, what about bent over T-bar rows? Or put them in the corner because Ronnie did them. And, um, and I'm always saying, depending on who you are and depending on what you have access to, it's not inherently bad, but it should be relative common sense that as soon as you don't have a chest pad, what else is involved? You know, hips. So if you're not, as you bend over and get in a position, if you don't let that weight pull you into further hip flexion, then your hip extensions are working. Hip extensions are pre- performing an isometric the whole time. If your spine isn't moving, then all your erectors are performing an isometric the whole time. If someone's going to say, is that bad? I want bigger erectors. I want bigger glutes. That can be fine. But again, it comes down to this notion of efficiency where if you're trying to grow your upper back and you have other things you have to consider, you know, hips, you have your erectors to consider, it might not be arguably as efficient. So again, I say chest supported because if I do the chest support, essentially, as long as I'm not coming on and off the pad, I'm taking my erectors, I'm taking my hips out of it. Um, so, you know, T-bar rows, I think are a great option. They technically actually get, depending on your T-bar team, a bit lighter at the top, which is a decent profile thing, although not, not mm-hmm. that huge of a deal. Um, as far as lats are concerned, um, I, I prefer single arm stuff. And especially for um, my population, where generally the bigger people get, and not just from a pure bone structure standpoint, that's a part of it, but literally just in the amount of tissue they have, mm-hmm. it starts to change your exercise mechanics a bit. Um, and so single arm, single arm pull down stuff are probably my favorite uh, lat variations. And so this is one where it kind of makes the meatheads mad because I basically have to say using a cable or using a machine, I think is going to be the best option there. Mm-hmm. But it's the same thing. If that's alignment is really, really huge. So you look at what kind of stuff, you know, can take in and, and do um, uh, shoulder extension. And you have a lot of stuff that can contribute to shoulder extension. So it's really for that reason, alignment for lat training becomes very important. Because you'll have lots of people when they train lats, they feel more rear delts. Rear delts will always be involved. It's impossible to take them out. They feel more teres. They feel more whatever, other stuff. 
Um, and so again, it's that allows for really where your optimal arm path is, in my opinion, some variation of being able to just kind of move comfortably at the side of your body. And so because of how different people's structures are, I think that's why single arm stuff tends to work great. So for a typical um, back day, if I want more upper back stuff, some sort of chest supported row. So if you don't have a T-bar, it could be a chest supported barbell row. You can just set it up basically on an incline bench, chest supported dumbbell row, same thing, set it up on an incline bench um, for some sort of single arm pull down. So it could be a machine. Uh, and again, I have some, some brands that I like, but obviously it could be almost any machine that you can make. If you can just have this arm path, just basically fit your, fit your goal to the machine, not the other way around. And then, um, and then if you don't have a machine, you could have a cable would be a good sub. And if you don't have cables, obviously I think pull-up variations can still be fine lat exercises. And I think you're just going to be best off with some sort of neutral-ish grip with, again, if you were really narrow in here or really wide, you know, if you go too wide, you're actually going to limit how much that upper arm can move. If you go a little bit too narrow, you're going to start to incorporate this kind of stuff, internal external rotation, where if I had a nice neutral grip for pull down or for pull-ups, I can still have that arm moving at my side type thing. Um, and because mm -hmm. of how your body position is on for those pull-up variations, it can tend for some people to incorporate a little bit more upper back stuff. But again, depending on the equipment you have access to, you can absolutely still develop good lats that way as well. So typically I have one good one for upper back one good one for lats like that. And of all those variations, just kind of what fits best for you. What do you have access to? Because obviously, like I said, that matters. Um, I generally like to do a row variation again, then too, that's um, with the idea of a little bit more lat focus. And the big difference there is when I was saying the T-bar stuff is this mm -hmm. upper arm path where I really think of how far back can I drive my elbows? How far mm -hmm. back can I retract my shoulder blades? Whereas if I was doing a row more for lats, again, I'm going to go with that similar arm path tucked a little bit more at my side and basically just moving a little bit more comfortably at my side as I go. So for me, kind of the bare bones, typical workout and the order could change depending if you want more upper back or more lats, but might be something where I do a, a row that's more for upper back, a pull down biasing, trying to be mainly lats, a row that's a little bit more lats and then something for erectors as well too. So depending on the person, I honestly, I think the best, um, the best variation, best deadlift variation for back is going to be some sort of RDL or stiff leg deadlift variation. Um, and again, that's where that, that would change with programming, again, depends on the individual, depends on how that fits in the rest of their program. Because again, the same thing, if I have someone that's extremely massive, um, I might either have to program that later or not program that at all. And, and then for some people, again, where you have limiting factors where, again, it's an RDL is still primarily a hip movement. That's the prime mover. That's actually getting the most load and torque as well too. But your erectors are right next in line. They're performing a strong isometric the whole time as well there too. Arguably, isometrics might not be the best way to grow erectors, but seems to work pretty well for them. So that's why we program them a lot. Mm -hmm. And then for if I was doing erectors, then too, depending on the individual, depending on how important they were, I like to in incorporate some sort of low back extensions as well, too. Um, so that would be a typical workout where, depending again on the person, might have RDLs or might have erector, uh, low back extensions instead. And some people, if erectors are really the goal, I would, I would have both, honestly. Um, so those are some of my top picks there for um you know back stuff is kind of the core ones and then the mm -hmm. same deal there's a whole bunch of even I'm, there's a ton of movements that i include that i didn't put on that list but those are some of the core ones that i have some variation of in um almost for everyone mm -hmm. awesome tips the back is a very complex muscle group as you mentioned so it's yeah. always a, a a tricky discussion topic but yeah i think mm -hmm. chest supported rows are really awesome and just the fact that they take your your lower back out of the equation and allow you to yeah. really focus on things and it's kind of a bodybuilder's you know dream um yeah the, the i also really like the point about the single arm pull downs where Ooh. when you switch to one arm you get a little bit more freedom Ooh. to move around i have yeah. uh a favorite little uh, pull down variation I call the Dr. Swole pull down, but it's basically yeah. where you like sit on the ground at a 45 degree angle to the cable. Mm -hmm. So you're yep. basically, you can basically line up your scapula and do uh, a, an adduction focused pull down. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great thing for, especially for more advanced people when they are more worried about fatigue, where you can play with these more advanced variations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to take a moment and shout out your app, Joe. So Joe has a uh, an app for hypertrophy, which is super cool nowadays seeing apps come out and it's the, the new generation of training. Could you tell us a bit about yeah. it? Yeah, thanks, man. Um, yeah, so I've got the app is just called Hypertrophy Coach. So if you go anywhere, you get apps and just type in Hypertrophy Coach, you'll find it. Um, and it's honestly the funny thing I tell people all, all the time, anybody has no idea who I am um, or my background or anything. Um, I've, I've been in this industry in a very interesting time where I started training personally, like I said, back in the late nineties, 
just being a bodybuilding meathead, um, then went to school, got my degree in exercise science. And, um, and I was a trainer working in like big box gyms, um, working as a training manager, developing trainers for probably like 10 plus years before I had social media. Mm. <laughs> so that's people I say, Oh, how do I do what you do or this and that? And I still think if you want to be a coach or a trainer, go train human beings in person, <clears throat> excuse me. Cause when I was coming up, this whole online thing wasn't even an option. I mean, I didn't, mm. I didn't know anything about it. I knew some you know, coaches and stuff that did uh, work with bodybuilders and stuff that never really appealed to me, like the guru type thing, people that do the nutrition and supplementation, all that. I always just like training people and training people in person. Um, so anyway, I say all that because I'm thankful that my focus has always been actually training people and helping people and, you know, having to see a body in person <clears throat> changes your perspective on everything. And so anyway, I say all that because people encouraged me late in my career to start on social media. So I was like, all right, because people encouraged me to, I did it. People seemed to like it. So I kept doing more of it. And then from social media, the demand came from people saying, we want more of your content. And that's so I always tell people now, I think a lot of people get into the industry backwards where they're just like, I just want to be an online coach, or I just want to have an app, or I just want, they want the end part. And I'm like, I don't know how to tell you how to do that. If you don't have the beginning part, I was going to say, there's not too many medical doctors that haven't seen patients and then go on and have some sort of app where it's like, let me tell you how to like treat people and what's the best, whatever. I'm like, I personally wouldn't want medical advice from a doctor that's never treated a patient in person right i mean i think that's that changes anything right i mean obviously it's the same thing too where like a lot of the stuff you're learning in a classroom certainly was beneficial but everything i'm sure massively changes when you actually have human beings in front of you um so i say all that because when i was doing the online thing people said we want more content want more content and i was lucky to have a client that i was training at the time that said you need to make an app people are starting you need to make a website this is before apps were even big make a website people are doing this where they just want more content on a website and so figured that out, I have a great business partner now that does all the tech stuff because I can't do anything. Eventually, we just turn the content into an app form because it's just much more easier and convenient. Um, and so honestly, it's just this massive thing just as far as what's on there. But the, the short overview is now to simplify it because that was the big thing. There's so much content on it. But the simplified thing is uh, when you go in now, you basically just go by your goal. Um, and we have everything integrated from you know a diet standpoint to a program standpoint. And then where you can really go down the rabbit hole is from an education standpoint, you know, so if you go on there, basically you say, Hey, what's my priority? What's my goal? And it'll kind of walk you down a path with what do you need to do with your diet? And so the diet part is just a recent update on there. That's huge. Where basically it'll say, okay, based on all of the things that you input questionnaire and all that kind of stuff, here's your, what your macro goal should be. And it's extremely adjustable because some people know, okay, well, this is where this is recommending, but I want a little bit more protein. I need slightly more calories than that, whatever. Um, and then from those macro adjustments, you can choose like, okay, well, how many meals do I want? When do I want to do check-ins through the app? All that good stuff. And, um, and again, all that stuff is customizable. And then we actually have it where you can build your diets in there as well, too. So we have a huge database, a few hundred thousand foods in there, um, things that you can scan. We have over 100,000 foods you can scan, and then it just goes in, puts your macros, and it's super easy and simple to build your diet. And then basically it just tracks as you're going through the day as well, too, as you actually do a meal. It'll say, okay, well, this is how far you are, because a lot of people really like, you know, you could do it if you're a traditional bodybuilder. You can also do just kind of the macros thing. So even if you're like, all right, I'm having my food here. I'm going to save all my million carbs for the end of the day or whatever the hell you want to do. It mm -hmm. kind of shows where you're going along with the day. And then you do check-ins on it. So it's a nice part. You do check-ins where it asks eventually, and we're going to try and integrate it with wearables as well too. Um, but does check-ins and basically based on those check-ins, we'll make adjustments to your diet. You know, So it's okay if you're putting on weight too fast or not losing fast enough, then it'll make adjustments based on that. And then the programs is probably my passion is the training. So right now, I think there's 15 full programs on there. They're like 12 week programs. Um, and then we have stuff for beginners. So we have like full body. We're actually having in the process of a couple more full body options, half body options, push, pull, lower options into the, some of the more advanced stuff, more body part specializations. So if you say, I want my body priority, body part is chest, back, blah, blah, whatever. We have one for basically every single body part. Um, and then I have some more advanced stuff on there. So I've got a really cool, um, powerlifting, excuse me, um, power building program I did with Ben Pollock. Mm. Um, I've got some of the athletes that I work with their programs on there. I'm starting to do a little bit more of that. So I have Terrence and I's current program on there, programs we've used in the past. Um, a couple other pros that I work with, I'm starting to put their programs on there as well too. Um, and that's just all that's integrated within the app as well too. So you follow this 12 week program, you actually log and track everything in the app. So there's a log book that can basically track and monitor all your stuff. You can look at progress. So you can look at basically where these lifts have progressed it over 12 weeks on these charts. We have things where Here's the total volume that maybe here's my volume progression. If that's something you like to look at and then it's all integrated as well too. When you're doing an exercise, it says, okay, we're on this exercise. We're doing three sets or whatever. There's a video you can click on right there that goes to the exercise library. So it's like, that's my big thing is on paper is important. How you're doing things more important. And so that some people will never use that. Some people love that. They'll go to the exercise library and watch absolutely every single thing. 
it's a cool thing. I didn't know yeah. that I'd ever be into it. And I'm, but hopefully you can tell I'm talking about I'm pretty, pretty proud of the product that we made and, um, you know, trying to deliver something really, really, you know, comprehensive from, you know, just the, what am I actually need to do to produce results and how can I have a deeper understanding of, you know, why I'm doing all these things or how I should be doing all these things. So, yeah. Yeah. That's sick. It's definitely something to check out. And I've seen a lot of positive reviews on about the app. So moving on, tell us about shoulders. Um, shoulder. I mean, I, I love training delts, man. Um, so what, I mean, some of this is I, I always tell people this, I think this stuff is important too, because I can relate to basically every part of the bodybuilding journey. Again, having been purely yeah. a meathead myself as I kind of started with stuff. Um, and so delts, I like, I love training delts a lot just because, um, you know, one, they naturally suck for me when I started. So there's a little bit of a, if I suck at something then I have to think a little bit harder to make it work, which is how most people, I think that's most people that start kind of down this education path sometimes end up being a trainer end up being what, sometimes it's we're not as naturally good at stuff as other people so that's kind of spurs that thought process um you know so for delts um for more uh like side delts just to keep things simple just so everyone obviously is on the same page side delts rear delts front delts um you know i think it's makes sense to have more biasing uh, rear delts and uh side delts um with raises um and it gives you a lot more freedom at the joint as well too you can play around with what arm path what position what amount of internal external rotation feels the best um, and then presses tend to still, I think, be the best option for front delts, although raises can make a lot of sense as well, too. But just the nature of how presses work and depending on the arm path you can choose, you're overloading, again, those positions of mid and length and ranges. Um, and again, because that's the big thing I would say with presses is just not feeling like you have to do a specific variation. You don't have to do these things out here at the side. Not that I think those are inherently bad. Mm -hmm. But again, depending on your shoulder joint, your structure, I tend to like presses tucked in here a little bit more. And if you got the range of motion, this could be a barbell. This could be a dumbbell. This could be a Swiss bar. I think Swiss is one of the most underrated bars just for having something where you have this kind of neutral grip um, overhead pressing stuff. One of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had to say my, my favorite um, for um, front delts is going to be probably like a Swiss bar press. Although I've used everything like I like us to do sometimes this kind of press basically in a Smith um, or with a barbell. I've still done three weights. I think actually can be great and dumbbells as well too. The only thing that stinks with dumbbells as people get stronger and stronger and stronger, literally semantically just getting in place can be horrible. You know, once you're using over 120 pound dumbbells, you basically have to kind of single arm curl. That's an athletic movement in and of itself, getting it up yeah. above your shoulder. Um, and if I'm looking at rear delts, um, I honestly, I like the reverse pec deck, I think is a great option just for overloading through that, again, that lengthened all the way through almost the shortened range. You know, if people have an issue with the pec deck, you probably can't quite get the rear delt fully shortened. Um, but again, same as any other exercise, I like it because you can easily overload the ranges where I think it has the most opportunity to grow. Um, mm -hmm. I also love cable variations. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's a thing where for delts, most people if something don't like the information I put out for delts is I vastly prefer uh, cables and machines for raises over doing you know, free weights. Um, and the main reason any type of free weight raise for the most part, lying on your side can be one of the exceptions, uh, but overloads just that shortened position. So if I do a rear delt, you know, raise or rear delt row or whatever, if I do a dumbbell lateral raise, or whatever, not saying those are bad, but they, they overload the shortened position. And then even more importantly, I think they don't adequately train where you're stronger. They're not, like if when your arms at your side, that's probably where your delts near strongest. And there's almost no load there at that point in time, mm. you know, so for rear delts, I like reverse pec deck. I like cable variations, cable variations on paper are probably going to be the best um, because you can overload that length and range to the mid range. And then you got a lot of versatility with arm pass. So one of the issues that some people have with pec deck, depending on how you have your torso set up, it can be a little bit tricky. I don't ever think, I don't ever like to just purely demonize positions. So people sometimes say anything that's kind of this high elbow position is inherently bad. I don't think that's the case, but for someone that has issues with it, then of course a cable is beautiful because you can choose a little bit of a different arm path or something and still overload um, you know, the, the, the muscle and the length that I think is the most efficient. Um, and then same for side raises. Um, I like cable variations. So a lot of people have seen, I have like a lying cable variation that I really like, um, but you can do the same thing standing where again, the beauty of a cable is when your arms at the side, you have that cable at about 90 degrees, you're overloading that length and position. And as you come to the top, it generally gets lighter. And again, for a single joint, that's considered a very good, efficient profile. Uh, but the same with machines. If you have a good lateral raise machine, there's going to be load right from the start of that motion, you know, right from the very you know beginning of going into that abduction. Um, so Again, it's, I think those people will still take out of context and, and someone will say, I said lateral raises or rear delt dumbbell raises are bad, which is not what I said. 
Mm -hmm. um, especially again, if that's the only equipment you can have access to, can you get big delts doing those? Of course. Uh, but again, efficiency becomes to be the, the limiting factor there a lot of times. And you see it too. It's, I mean, people, as they try and, those are super hard exercises to progress, like progress lateral raises, document progressive overload over time. Mm -hmm. And people don't always think about why is because there's only one part that's hard. You know, so it's not just this whole range of motion you're trying to have progressive overload. You're always limited by what you can do at the top. So you're basically trying to progressive overload this one position. And that's probably why I think it's one of the most cheated exercises in, in existence, where if you go into <laughs> anybody doing it in a gym, that's why I always joke. I just tell people, if you want to know how strong you are at lateral raises, the first thing you can do is just sit down when you do them. And people don't like that. And it's because as soon as you sit down, I don't care who you are, your load sometimes is going to get chopped in half or like 30% down. And they're like, I don't want to, I'll be like, well, why don't you want to do them sitting down? And like, well, I can't do as much weight. And I was like, so exactly. You can't do as much weight, but now your delt actually has to be the thing that's limited by how much weight you can do. And then I'll go another step further. You want to do dumbbells, then do them on a bench seated down with your chest on a pad. So you can't do any of this as well too. And their weight gets chopped down again. And so people get upset about that stuff. Where again, the most basic logic should imply if the goal is to train your delts, if when you sit down, you cut the amount of weight that you can use significantly, you should be well aware that you weren't using just delts. And so again, that comes back to the bodybuilding thing. Now that being said, I always give this asterisk too, good throw at some point in time. Uh, people will say like, how do you, how do you train in normal gyms? Like they'll say, when I go into a gym, like, how do I train? Do I just look around and think everybody's doing stuff horrible? Mm. And I'm like, no, I don't care at all. And because the funny thing is people have, you have no idea what someone's goal is. And again, I've been working in normal gyms since I've been working in gyms since I was maybe 19 i think my first job working full-time as a trainer since i was 22 and i've worked in very just normal populations and i would joke i would love and some of the gyms i'd go at you know like these old guys that would come in the gym it was like their social club they just come in and they yeah. hang out with other people and i joke they get on one machine and i I've, there's guys i would literally remember that a lot of these old guys for whatever reason would get on this machine that was intended to be a calf raise but they'd kind of use it like this short range of motion leg press and they put like the whole stack on there and stuff and i would just have this dialogue in my head where i imagine they'd go home and tell their wives Oh, I still got it, honey. I did the whole stack on this machine and I went to the gym and, you know, they're like, oh, good for you going to the gym. We're really going to the gym as he's doing three sets of uh, leg press on the calf raise. And then he goes and sits in the sauna and chats with his other guys and comes home. All that being said, there's some old guy that's waking up and going to the bar. He's retired and effing, I'm going to go to the bar every day, or you're going to go and do something else. that's not physical at all. Or you're going to go sit and whatever. I don't know. So this guy's choosing to go and do something remotely physical. I don't know what the hell his goal is. It's better than sitting on the couch. It's better than doing nothing. So while someone would look at that, and I did find it funny still, it is you can't do a leg press on a calf raise is funny. That being said, I don't think he's a bad person. And again, his goal isn't to get freaking swole. So the same reason somebody might just like doing these lateral raises where it's a whole body <laughs> movement because they're just letting some aggression out. And that's why I joke too, this person might be in the gym because them coming to let aggression out in there, they don't let aggression out in the real world, right? So if I'd rather have someone come and have aggression in the gym with bad form so they don't murder people in real life. So that's what I joke. This person's goal in the gym could be murder prevention, in which case you don't have to have good form to have murder prevention. You just have to go and lift some shit and swing some shit around. <laughs> and um, so that's, I literally say people think it is kind of a funny joke, of course. And uh, I mean, there are people I'm sure that it is murder prevention, which I'm very, very grateful for because I'm not a fan of getting murdered. Um, you know, so it's, if someone's in the gym, I, I never know what someone's goal is. So I'm not the guy walking around like, oh, bad form, bad form, bad form. Who the hell cares? It's like, I can't imagine me going to a bowling alley and there's some like professional bowler down there. I'm like, look at this jackass. I'm like, I'm here with my little kids, man. And like, if I want to roll it between my legs, F off, I'm going to roll it between my legs. You know, if I want to throw it overhand, this is what I'm here for. I'm not here to be a good bowler. I'm here to be just be here with my kids and happen to be bowling at the same time. So people, people lose context of that as well, too. I think it's important because my, my category is advanced is nerd stuff and all that kind of stuff. That being said, you know, I'm a human being. I, I know what it means to be a human being. And I know some people don't give a shit about this and that's fine as well too. So I think obviously, if, especially for people watching this, eventually, if you want to be an educator in some way, shape or form, I think that gets glossed over. Like we need to, you should have this whole spectrum of where humans exist and try and speak to the spectrum and be real. Just because I speak this very specific thing doesn't mean that everybody else cares about it. So that's, um, you know, people take the human part out of it. And I, I think that's something that you don't, you don't want to do, you know, especially when trying to create some good context behind what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know, Joe, I think cheating is immoral and uh, anyone who has bad form should be put in jail. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we should all, we should just take videos of it and post it and all the smart people can go on and we can comment on how bad the person is and how good they are for knowing what good form is. <laughs> okay. So moving along here. Yeah. How about biceps? 
Um, so all on biceps and triceps and together. Um, yeah. so the single biggest thing I would say for arm training is alignment. So if something, if there's something where I would say one of those variables becomes more important, I would say it's, it's arms. And I just, this is the nature of, um, and it's even, it's even different from legs. The whole reason is like, if you, if we had hands at the end of our legs, uh, that's the funny thing. What, why don't we have as many, because people think, oh, how many, how many different curl variations and stuff do I have to do? I have a billion curl variations, a very billion extension of variations. But if we look at like isolated knee extension and knee flexion, why do we have like two curl variations and one extension variation? That's all we've got. And it's like, well, how the hell are we getting the job done with those with only one variation of isolation each? Well, mm. the difference is we don't have hands at the end of our legs. So it just limits how we actually are going to express load through basically our lower limbs. But that should be evidence that we, you don't need a whole lot, right? You know, so if we can get away with training quads with only one isolated knee extension, why the hell would we need so many elbow things? And I understand, you know, crossing over the shoulder joint might change and things would be the uh, reason for some variety. You could say the same thing about the rec fim as well, too. So um, I say all that little asterisk is it's you don't need a whole lot. But what you choose, you want to be very careful aligns well through the elbow joints. And I would say this is one of those where there's these exercise notions that you have to do. And I know because I did them as well, too. Again, all this comes from I, when I'm trying to tell people mistakes not to make. It's because half of my expertise comes from having made more mistakes than most people listening. And um, so I'm trying to not just say, hey, here's the mistakes I've seen myself. And then I've also trained people with thousands of hours and thousands of collective years of experience of making mistakes as well, too. So if I do one umbrella thing that I'd say would be different is I do a ton of single arm stuff. Mm. Um, and where the, the same goal with single arm for alignment, I do a ton of cable stuff, especially with triceps. And the whole point of that is just alignment is making sure that that force lines up nicely through the elbow joint. And the reason I say that's so important is not just so you don't wreck your elbows while you're training arms, but you need your elbows for the entire rest of your upper body as well, too. So it's again, if you're, if you have elbow issues, not only does it mess up your arm training, it messes all your upper body training up. Um, so if I have some favorite stuff, um, you know, for curl variations, I think there's, you know, you want some, even just like a standing curl is a good exercise for basically overloading, you know, the mid range, not the length and range quite as much. Um, but there's a reason just a standing barbell curl parts of it are good. And again, it overloads that mid range again, which is a place that you're strong. But as soon as you grab onto a barbell, a lot of people that doesn't fit. So I'd rather just do single arm dumbbell curls has the exact same loading pattern if you're just doing free weight, but you can make it line up with your joints a lot better. And so my single favorite for going within that same thing, when I'm kind of expanding on some more principles for uh, biceps is always going to be some sort of preacher curl variation. And if we look at one, you can make it line up perfect. So if you want to line it up perfect, um, it gets a little bit tricky for different things, but just have your upper arm perpendicular to the ground. You know, so when it's on that preacher curl pad, have an idea of what perpendicular means. If you have it there, you're pretty much going to be in a good spot. And then the beauty of that is most of them, if it's not, you know, if it's not a 45 degree angle, that's <clears throat> not quite as vertical as you'd want. But let's say hypothetically, <clears throat> excuse me, it's like a 60 ish degree angle that creates a better profile. So as opposed to doing a curl with my arm at my side, mm -hmm. now I at least have some load at the bottom. Or again, if you know, if basically when your arm's perfectly vertical, when you're doing a standing curl, you know, when your hand's right below your elbow, there's no load in that length and position. So just by taking it and putting your upper arm, hopefully people can tell I'm trying to demonstrate my upper arm, lower arm together. Mm -hmm. When you put that stuff on a pad, now there's going to be some load that hand never gets directly below the elbow in the bottom. So there's some load in the length and range. If you set it up properly, the mid range is still the most loaded. Um, and then it drops off and gets lighter in the short. And then that whole bracing thing, you have your upper arm, <clears throat> you can smash it into that pad. You don't have as much other stuff that could be a limiting factor, which again, is you don't want your shoulder to be the limiting factor, but also it's again, that complexity thing. It takes out a lot of people like, Oh, I like to curl, you know, a straight bar with a billion pounds. And it's like, okay, well, same type of thing. Put your back against something and say, how, how much do you actually curl with a straight bar? Put your back against something. Holy shit, I don't curl as much as I thought I curled. It's like, again, you were curling that bar. Your biceps weren't necessarily curling all of it. And so, again, that's that um, one, not having limiting factors, but two, lots of that bracing stuff will help prevent um, cheating. Um, so preacher curls are always the core of my bicep training. Um, and then I think there's merit to, if you want a fully lengthened bicep because the crossover the shoulder joint, particularly the long head, you want to have that upper arm basically extended behind you to some degree as well too. So incline curl variations, like on an incline bench, again, I think the cable variation can line up for more people. So again, having the cable somewhat behind you doing cable mm -hmm. curls. And I would say like, if I have, those are my two biggest staples for biceps, preacher mm -hmm. curl variation, incline curl variation. 
And then I generally think it's good at some point in time to pro, uh, program either like a neutral grip or pronated grip curls as well too. And how often and how frequent, again, depends on development, you know? So again, if we're just looking at other elbow flexors, just getting some forearm stuff in there as well too, brachialis, brachioradialis. Yeah. Um, I think that having some stuff, and then I always tell people this just biases it. So people always say, I've had people be like, oh, don't you want to do something to something specifically for the short head, specifically for the long head, specifically for the, you know, brachialis or brachioradialis or whatever. And I'm like, that's the whole thing where, again, it's, it is individual. Some people could just do this type of curl and all that shit just develops great. Good yeah. for them. Someone else, maybe not. And okay, we're going to program more of this stuff or maybe a little bit more of this stuff in there as well, too. So for biceps, that's kind of my top three preachers, incline curl variations, something at some point in time with neutral or pronated, you could program those at different points in time. Um, and then tricep stuff, um, any extension is pretty much almost always done with a cable. And the same thing, if you're looking at where, when you're going into full extension, having that cable line up through the elbow joint is really what you're looking for. So if people see me doing lots of cable stuff. If you do overhead stuff, if you do skull crusher stuff and your upper arm and elbow flares out at all, that's a pretty good indication that it might not fit you great. And that's going to be one of those where I've, I've done those. It might not hurt your elbow when you're doing it. Someone will say, well, I do it like that, but it doesn't hurt my elbows. That might be like an orthopedic thing that, again, from my experience, catches up with you over time. Um, so for isolated extension for triceps, it's almost all cable stuff, cable cross variations, cable like behind the head, skull crush variations with the cable, single arm stuff I think is great. And I actually think compound movements can have a, a lot of benefit for triceps as well too. I actually think they line up better than the isolation stuff. So when people say, I don't think most like barbell skull crushers are great. I don't think overhead, you know, barbell stuff is great. Even if it's a camber bar, I just don't think it fits most people. But that doesn't mean I think free weight stuff is bad for triceps. You know, a lot of close grip press variations. Well, probably my favorite compound movement is jam press variations. So basically, you're just taking like a close grip thing. And the higher you bring that bar up your body, all other things being the same, <coughs> excuse me, the more it ends up being triceps and the less it's going to be, um, you know, delts involved, which is the problem with a typical close grip is it might end up being just primarily um, front delts. Mm -hmm. And I think dips can have a great place as well, too. But again, with those compound movements, you generally need to modify them a little bit to make it a little bit more tax on the elbow and not so much going to be um, the shoulder joint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. <coughs> yeah, great points. And <clears throat> also about, yeah, like what you said about biceps, about, you know, if you're if you're doing a curl, you're going to be hitting a lot of these muscle groups. And I think people often get lost in the weeds saying like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I want to do this specific curl for like the short head and that's all I want or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. How about calves? Um, you know, so calves are, in my opinion, pretty, um, I don't want to say, they're, they're pretty simple from an exercise selection standpoint, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Um, people can overcomplicate it a little bit. Um, where people mess up is just how they perform them. Um, so if I had to pick one favorite calf exercise, it's going to be something that's just a hip loaded calf raise. Um, so again, you, they actually, obviously there's a lot of uh, companies that make sleds where basically you're just sitting on, you know, the pads against your hips, you know, and your ankles or your, excuse me, your feet are on something and you're just doing isolated, uh, plantar dorsiflexion. And, um, the reason I just slightly prefer that over standing, like a standing calf raise, which is also a fine exercise is now you just have less stuff in between. So the weight's not on your shoulders. You don't have to stabilize and hold your spine still. And I say the same thing on that. You know, lots of times when you have stuff like that, all that stuff in between, it can be an opportunity to cheat. But with a calf raise, it's an example of where you can actually just have stuff being a limiting factor. So having all that extra stuff you have to stabilize, loading your spine and pelvis still, as soon as you take that out and load through the hips instead, then it's going to be generally not only less likely to cheat, but also handle more load. So lots of times that actually works in the favor of being able to do more load by having less limiting factors. Mm -hmm. um, and so if people don't have like a hip loaded calf raise, any leg press will work. So generally, almost any leg press will work. We're basically the same thing. You're just sitting in it, put your feet to the bottom of the, the, the platform and just same thing, isolated plantar dorsiflexion. So that's probably my top pick. I honestly don't program bent knee stuff quite as much. Um, mm -hmm. People like to say how that works more soleus. And it's kind of one of these weird things where if something's working less, is something else working more? Because really, as you just, if you flex that knee, you really shorten the gastroc so it yeah. crosses over the, the knee. And so arguably by putting that gastroc in a more shortened position, it is not mechanically as advantaged as when it's more lengthened. So it's not working or not able to work as much. In my opinion, that doesn't mean the soleus is doing more. The soleus probably does the exact same amount, no matter what, if loads are actually near failure. Um, and so for that reason, I don't know by doing bent knee stuff if you're really like, oh, this is for my soleus. It's like, well, it's probably your soleus is probably working the same amount when you had a straight knee. 
And um, so again, I could see the merit of if I do program both, I generally have 80% of my programming straight or knee stuff. You don't have to be completely straight, you know, straightish, slightly bent, just some more fixed knee stuff closer to extension, and maybe 20% bent knee stuff. So like a seated calf raise, basically. Um, and the biggest thing that people mess up on that is uh, form. And so, you know, you have people where if you're looking at, you know, training the calves to their full range of motion. So what is your full, you know, dorsiflexion, full plantar flexion? Um, it's a relatively short range of motion, a short distance traveled. Um, so because it's, and when you're doing it, it's far away from your eyes too. So if you, you know, if you cut off an inch of your range of motion doing a calf raise, it, what's an inch? How much does that matter? Well, an inch on a calf raise could be 25% of the range of motion, right? Whereas if you cut off an inch on a squat, it doesn't make a big difference. But if I say, hey, you cut off 25% of the range of motion of a squat, okay, that's a pretty noticeable difference. So just because of the distance traveled, you know, leaving percentages of range of motion off are much more common and not as noticeable in my opinion. Um, so it's a tricky balance of, you know, making sure that you're actually training through the full range of motion, getting them fully lengthened, and most importantly, taking them at some point in time through a fully short and fully contracted position. Mm. And the simple tip I give people on that is lots of times you don't need different exercises. You just need different loads. So have some time where you're doing a lighter load so you can actually get that uh, calf fully shortened and fully contracted. And then you do need heavier stuff as well too, because again, if you stayed with a load that you could only get to that fully shortened position, then odds are that same load is under training what you're capable when that calf is more lengthened. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, it's a very typical thing where if I'm programming, you know, working sets for someone, you have a couple sets with here's your heavier weight and intentionally staying short because you can't fully contract or fully shorten. And then having some sets that are lighter where you can actually get into that position. Um, and then most people don't have, I mean, so same as any muscle, <coughs> excuse me, people say, you know, there's a genetic limiting factor, which for sure, I think your, your insertions make a big difference on that. Cause you'll literally see some people where if you look at their lower leg, you know, their actual, their tendon is this long. Yeah. If your tendon is this long and your muscle belly is this long, you're not going to have the biggest calves in the world. It's literally impossible. And you have some people, the people that always have the biggest calves is like their tendon is this long and their muscle belly is this long. It literally looks like the muscle belly inserts right basically into their foot. And you're, and it's like, that's the last person you want calf advice from. I'm like, shut up. What's your calf advice? You walk <laughs> like, good job. And um, you know, so there is uh, same as anything. It, you're overall, again, if you have that long tendon, short muscle belly, you're not going to have the biggest calves in the world, but it will still grow the same as any muscle. So again, it's people say, oh, calves are all genetic. That's, that's crap. Yes. I mean, but it's, you just have to realize that it's just never going to be, it's never going to be crazy. You know, it's again, if you don't have the genetics of Phil Heath's arms, you're never going to have Phil Heath's arms, same thing. And some of that is again, list, limited by tendon and muscle belly size. Um, so, but where most people actually have shitty calves is one, they don't perform them right. And then two, they don't prioritize them or train them with adequate frequency. I think the nature of calves is they need a little bit more frequency. And if they're really a priority, you need to do the same with any other thing that you would prioritize, put them at the beginning of a workout. And that's the most common thing. People say, oh, my calves suck. They won't grow. And I'm like, well, when do you do them? I do them on leg day. Okay. When do you do them on leg day? The last thing on leg day. I'm like, all right, great. So you train them once a week and you train them at the end of all of your biggest body parts already having had a good workout. Okay. Good job. There's nothing you can figure out there. Well, why they maybe aren't growing. Um, and so some of that too is there is programming does matter at some points in time as well too. How you do things matter, obviously, and programming matters. So a lot of people don't have calves because they, they don't genuinely prioritize them. And I'm in that boat um, where again, if you've anyone seen my calves, I, I have pretty high insertion. So a very long tendon, a pretty short muscle belly. And I literally trained for five years and had people make fun of me and say that I have small calves. And now they're not as big as they used to be. People all the time like say, oh man, you got big calves. And I remember when I actually started having bigger calves is literally, I think I was 20, 20, 21 years old. And I just was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to train them first. At the time, my best body part was chest. So I started training calves before chest mm -hmm. and lo and behold, they started to grow. It was a miracle. <laughs> um, and then I just, I, then I just trained, I figured out frequency worked obviously a little bit better. And now other people have figured that out as well too. So most people can get away two or three times a week. And, um, you know, for having high insertions, I've got some, some decent calves now and same with, you know, clients that actually do that kind of stuff. You'll find, that's a joke now Terrence uh, train Terrence is that he gets compliments on his calves now he's like holy shit I'm getting compliments on my calves <laughs> and I was like yeah I mean wow. you're never gonna have the biggest calves <laughs> in the world because he's same thing he's got those short muscle bellies long tendon but is he's got decent calves now and it's like oh well same as anything you train it, you prioritize it shit can actually grow a little bit so there's nothing like getting complimented on your calves <laughs> yeah what's even the calves or anything when you have a body part you've never <laughs> had before it's like um holy shit did that just happen <laughs> yeah 
Awesome. Yeah. So I also really like the how you made the point that you can actually emphasize different ranges or different parts of the range of motion, mm -hmm. especially for something like calves where like the the actual movement pattern is very simple, but uh, you can actually play around with it a little bit, even within mm -hmm. the sort of standard exercise. Yeah. So yeah, I think this has been an awesome episode. I think there's been a ton of knowledge that you've dropped today and people are really going to benefit from this. How can so. people find you? Um, so, I mean, Instagram is probably my big um, place where I put out the most free content. YouTube is, is actually pretty big. I had a little bit of break <clears throat> over the holidays, but I've been pretty consistent with YouTube as well. So on Instagram, if you just search hypertrophy coach, uh, <clears throat> spelled exactly how it sounds, hypertrophy coach. Uh, same thing on YouTube. I'm actually doing the TikTok thing a little bit now, nice. trying to put some content on there. So those are my, my free content avenues. I always tell people if, well, from here from this is a balance of um, you know, there's some nerd stuff in some of my content. So you'll see if it's your cup of tea or not by looking at some of my free stuff. And then, like I said, then my main thing that I do um, now from a business standpoint is trying to help as many people as I can through the app. And uh, so obviously if that's, you know, for more deeper education programs, stuff like that, that's what that's there for. So. Yeah. Awesome. I'll put those links in the description and thanks. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm in my scrubs. I've got to run to the hospital after this. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely, man. Happy to be here.